tonight. Cheers. Uh, yeah, Rup is, uh, is Billy. What's Billy's last name? He's the ED of the... Uh, uh, okay, let's go back. Another piece of popular culture is the big man, <laughs> Willie from The Simpsons. You all know him, don't you? The thing with Simpsons is they're uh, incredibly leaning into the stereotypes here, you know? The thing with stereotypes is they're stereotypes for a reason. And everyone in Scotland knows a Willie. <laughs> So yeah, Scotch, you know, we've travelled all over the world. In fact, a few hundred years ago, we travelled all the way from Scotland over to America and made this our home. And then hundreds of years later, we came back, descendants of Scotland, came over to Scotland again, came up to the Scottish people like me in the street and said, all right there, I'm Scottish too. My great, great granddad was a McDonald. I'm like, yeah, that makes you about as Scottish as my big toe. You know, I've travelled, oh, I've traveled. Oh no, what's happening? <laughs> Good. There we go. You know, I've traveled all over the world. I've come over here to America, I've climbed on El Capitan in Yosemite. One of my favorite places in the world is Joshua Tree National Park. This keeps on breaking. Went over down to South America, climbed some big walls. It's me free climbing a big wall in South America, in uh, Cochimbo Valley in Patagonia. 2018, went to Madagascar. That's a cool place. We have a big old first set in Madagascar. But you know, honestly, the place that keeps bringing me back home is Scotland. Because Scotland, honestly, is, it's got everything. Scotland has amazing mountain trad. It's got incredible deep water soling above the frigid North Sea. It's got the hardest winter mixed climbing in the world. And it even has the best crack climbing. <laughs> you know, there's many things that make Scotland great, and one of the things I love about it is our traditional ethics. You know, we may have heard that in the UK we have a lot of trad climbing, um, not so much sport climbing, and trad climbing is definitely the best. And in Scotland, we have very strict traditional ethics, no boats in the mountains. And when I first went to places like Yosemite and, you know, the European Alps, climbing Chamonix, I was like, kind of flabbergasted how many boats there were. I was like, Jesus. You know, and I, I love sport climbing. I love boats. I'm here in Vendor Gorge, it's great. Um, but I was, the, thing about, um, the thing about the boats in, our, in Scotland is the traditional ethic. It's really amazing. Oh, it's gone. Oh, what's happened to you? Yeah, no. um, It's really amazing because nobody changes the wall to be ready for the climber. Only the climber that trains their body and their mind to be ready to confront with the rock. That's a really cool thing. Actually, that's a, that's a quote taken from Didier Berthaud from the 2006 film First Ascent, which was incredibly influential to me in my early years as a climber. But you know, I'm not here to talk about ethics, I'm not here to talk about mountains, I'm here to talk about the thing that I think Scotland does better than anywhere, else, anywhere, anywhere in the world, and that is sea cliffs. And the biggest and gnarliest sea cliffs of them all are in the far north of Scotland, beyond the mainland, in the Orkney Islands, specifically on the Isle of Hoy, and that is where the biggest vertical sea cliff of the, of the British Isles is, St John's Head, 400 metre sea cliff bursting out the sea. And on that wall is the hardest sea cliff in the world, the Long Hope. And the Long Hope was climbed in 1970 by two climbers, Ed Drummond and Oliver Hill, who climbed from sea to summit over seven days, battling birds, shoving wooden pegs into cracks for protection and sleeping on hammocks all the time, questing off into the unknown, uncertain if they were going to be successful and with no way to return if they didn't. And when they finally did, it was one of the greatest achievements of rock climbing of their generation. And then, 41 years later, it had its first free ascent by none other than the Scottish legend, Dave MacLeod. Now, to put this into perspective for you guys, you know, if uh, the long hope is our equivalent to the nose, then that makes Ed Drummond our equivalent to Warren Harding, which probably makes Dave MacLeod our equivalent to Lynn Hill. <laughs> you know, the guy likes eggs, but he also loves Pantene Pro-V. You know, there's lots of reasons why I would, uh, someone like me would be so aspiring, inspired to climb something like the Long Hope. You know, it's an amazing adventure, it's an amazing challenge, but also the stories, the history of the climb. It's what I love about climbing, you know, is every climb has a story to tell, and it's something that makes our sport incredibly unique. So I got together a band of friends, specifically my mate Emma Twyford, to join me on the wall. Emma's in the audience somewhere. And, uh, Unfortunately, this is not a story of success because me and Emma tried the long hope and we failed and for many reasons because the long hope is incredibly challenging in a number of ways. 
First of all, the rock there is choss. Pure and utter choss. It means it's loose. In fact, I've heard it being regarded as the world's biggest sandcastle. You have to be climbing on four points of contact at all times. If one hole breaks, you've still got another hand on the wall. Because if you fall off, the gear is unlikely to hold a fall. And if, if it does, you'll probably break your bones in the ledges below. And there's nobody coming to help you now. There. The other thing about the long is it's incredibly like a maze. A labyrinth of twists and turns, cracks and offwards and crawls. And it's incredibly easy to get lost up there, which me and Emma did a couple of times, which then ultimately led to our eventual failure. But the thing that's really cool about the Long Hope, the really special thing about the Long Hope, the, ch the hardest challenge of it all is the guardians of the, of the sea cliff. And that is the Fulmar. <laughs> now, the, if you say Fulmar to any Scottish sea cliff climber, they will quake in fear. You'll see their eyes dilate, the beads of sweat running down their forehead as they recall horrible stories of when they first came in contact with one of these creatures. For they have a bit of an unusual defense mechanism. They spit putrid, acidic vomit on their enemies. Much like that thing from Jurassic Park. Yeah, so you'll be climbing on the wall. You'll be climbing on the wall. You'll be getting higher, you'll hear their nattering. Probably talking about some other climber they spewed on before. You're like, climbing under the cliff, under the ledge, you're going along there. Quieter, quieter, you're like, they're not there, they're not there. You look at them, they're all the way over there. They're far enough away, I can get away with this. And then, SPOT! Oh, clever girl. It's another Jurassic Park reference for you there. Can we get this thing to work? That's not the only challenge of the long hope because the enormous grassy slab that leads its way up to the rock face and this thing is like 45 degree to vertical grass climbing with only two pieces of gear and 70 meters. Not only that, but there's thousands of little holes all over this thing all containing a fulmar ready to pounce out at you or spit vomit on you any time. It's like the world's biggest game of whack-a-mole. But you do all of that, you have the biggest day of your life and you arrive at the last 70 meters of the climb. A big sandstone face, a thin seam leading up to a blank face of crimps, and then the biggest exposed overhang of the entire wall. Now this is the crux pitch. It's 513D, protected only by a myriad of small wires and cams. And the thing about this is it might be the crux, but as I've said countless times before, you know, it's not the actual crux of the long hope. The crux of the long hope is arriving at this pitch after doing everything else with enough energy and enough mental tenacity to finally do this last 70 meter push. Now it won't surprise you when I say this that when I asked Emma to join me for a round two she told me to piss off. <laughs> and you know the thing is I, I almost gave up myself. But the thing, the thing about the long hope right is that when I was up there dangling hundreds of feet, hundreds of, 300, hundreds of meters up the ground with the waves crashing beneath me, dangling on a rope. You know, honestly, I've never felt more alive. The sun blasting its golden rays across the, the wall, creating that orange glow. You know, you really, if you could bottle that up, it'd be more powerful than any drug. And I'd be stinking rich. <laughs> So anyway, Emma didn't come back with me, but I managed to find a new partner. This was my mate Alex, who joined me up there. And, uh, you know, Alex actually, he had never done anything like this before. He was a boulderer, which meant he had no idea what he was getting into us in for. You know what they say, ignorance is bliss. And I'd love to show you guys, I'd love to tell you guys all about the story with me and Alex up there that happened this summer. But I'd rather show you. Now, I've got a film coming out in a few weeks' time, 21st November, on my YouTube channel. Go on over there, give me a subscribe, you can watch the film. But right now I'm going to show you a little trailer from the film. Sometimes, you know, the best days start off like this. You never know. 
So get down there and see what happens. I love adventure, I love challenge, and the long hope is both of those things instilled into one climb. It's a flipping massive big wall, a huge sea cliff, a chossy rock, former stick that you left right and centre in a long time ago. The idea of overcoming those challenges, those obstacles, trying to free this thing, to me, is just like the perfect adventure. That's why. Glad you guys enjoyed that run. <laughs> One final slide. Where is it? There it is. Okay, that's, that's the end of my talk. I just want to say one final thing, one final message. You know, I mean, very privileged, as I said, to travel all across the, the world in my last 15 years as a, as a climber. And, um, you know, things are changing now. And um, we've got global climate change. It's a real thing. And I think. I've realized that there's some big changes I needed to make to my life, you know, for the future of our planet. You know, there's some big changes need to be done in the world, that is, you know, political changes, corporate changes, but we also need to look at ourselves and see the changes we can make. And personally, I've made many changes in this time, but I've definitely decided to not travel by plane as much. That's one of the big ones that I've made for me personally. Um, you know, it's going to be very difficult because I've traveled all over for many years, but I'm only going to travel when I really have to. And uh, yeah, I think that we just all need to look at ourselves and decide you know, what we want to do if we need to make the changes that are going to be better for our future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Um, yeah, Scotland looks better than the Red River Gorge, but I don't know, maybe not, but it did look pretty awesome. Uh, it's Sophie. Sophie, you ready? Yeah. Give it up for Sophie. So I just came up with an idea. Each time there's a technical difficulty, everybody here has to chug a beer. <laughs> but, Pat, but Patagonia's not banned for all that, I don't think. <laughs> no, we'll see. I think, I think we'll get it sorted out. And if it takes too long, we could put it out to, uh, to questions. Is Robbie still around here? Or how, how are we doing back there? Yeah. Anybody? Uh, oh, I guess we're good. Sophie, here you go. I'm from Germany. Um, I have to say I'm super happy to be here in this amazing sandstone area. Thanks Robbie, uh, no, Billy, <laughs> and the River, Red River Goat Climbing Coalition uh, for making climbing possible here in this area. Um, so why I'm standing here is I want to talk about uh, eco-pointing. You might have heard of uh, red pointing, but have you heard of eco-pointing? Um, <laughs> so, apart from climbing, I'm also interested in nature and I studied in the field of uh, ecology and currently I'm doing a PhD in sport ecology. That means we are dealing with um, the management of recreational areas. So, we try to find solutions so that future generations, climbers, hikers, bikers, can still access uh, these wonderful natural areas. 
and yeah, coming back to this eco point concept. Well, the term rat point means that you climb the route without uh, putting any weight on the safety gear. Kurt Albert made it quite popular in the yeah 1970s. And yeah, what is eco point now? So a few friends of mine and me, we wanted to have a new challenge. And the challenge is making the approach to the crack um, as sustainable as possible. So not using the car, but uh, taking the feet, the bike um, or public transportation for the approach. And yeah, this is the idea. Well, the thing is, um, not everyone can do it, but I think everyone who's willing to can give it a try. And um, so this is the definition. So you climb a route and uh, just use the, big, uh, the bike, the feet and public transportation for the approach. And I also have a short video for you that uh, shows you my motivation and inspiration to do so. So let's have a look. If this is loading, um, probably it does, it just needs some time. That's also what the eco point is about, like accepting that you have to take a bit more time, that you have to plan ahead, that you have to inform yourself a bit more about the area and the infrastructure. But yeah, Justin, I think we just need the video from YouTube. So, I think this little video uh, showed you my motivation and um, I mean, I also flew here so I definitely asked myself, am I allowed to talk about this? But for me this concept is not about perfectionism and it's not about telling people what they should do and what they shouldn't do. It's just uh, yeah, um, the idea that everyone should be able to try and we thought it would be cool to have a name for it and uh, yeah, so let's call it Equal Point. Um, thanks to this video I also got to know Nadja who is a friend of, um, of mine now and she's also from the area of Frankenjura. And together we would like to um, yeah, collect information, bring climbers together and uh, think about how can we get to the cracks without uh, the car. And we want to include this in the next uh, climbing get back of our area. And um, yeah, we could already apply this idea of equal pointing during our uh, climbing festival in Frankenjura this summer, which is probably quite uh, similar to the Rocktoberfest. And uh, there we organized a shuttle bus for the climbers. And um, so we thought about um, a route for the bus, which took uh, the climbers from the train station to the festival area and the next uh, cracks that we chose. And yeah, they really appreciated it. They find, found it a quite a good idea to yeah not use the car, to use a bus, to be together. and. Um, yeah, to, to just try something new, to have a new challenge. And I also gave workshops where we could discuss like what are the challenges, how is it to, to take more time for the approach. And it was really cool to hear the opinions of people, but to also see that for a lot of us it's quite an added value. And uh, this time that we spend during uh, our approach that we can definitely also use it for ourselves. And so our project is meant to be a kind of a start of a movement, to be an inspiration for people, to also share their stories. Um, as I said, I mean, we really want to do this together with the climbing community. We want to collect the information together um, and provide it for everyone. <laughs> so 
yeah, I also could motivate some friends to, to try this EcoPoint approach to our um, last journey, like three weeks ago to Italy, where we took the bus, the train, the metro, and the bus. And it took a while, but uh, it was a really cool experience in the end. Um, so we also want to have this hashtag EcoPoint, where everyone uh, can post stories or yeah, just pictures or videos of uh, the last journeys they did and um, inspire each other because yeah sometimes it can be really exhausting and we also have this website right now like quite soon where we share all the information and uh, yeah last year I, I did a lot of epical pointing for example the picture on the right right side uh, shows you like I'm in Paris I uh, I took the bus to go to Oliana in Spain which yeah, it was 32 hours. It was quite exhausting, and uh, yeah, but I made it, and I was quite uh, proud <laughs> to just arrive at the crack. And um, yeah, so if you want to chat about eco pointing, if you want to exchange uh, challenges, I will be here at Miguel's the next two weeks. And uh, so yeah, we can meet in the evening. I'll be around cooking, and yeah, so. It's just one action uh, to to be a bit more climate positive. Yeah, we can also vote and do a lot of other stuff. But I think this is quite a nice idea for climbers to try something new, to have a new challenge. And yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Amazing. Yeah, I love. I've been very inspired by Sophie and this idea of eco pointing. I'm actually planning on riding my bike to Alaska this summer. I'm going to try and eco point Alaska. So, um, yeah. So all everybody here, we'll, we'll come back here next year and do more more presentations, and we'll give free beer and people and pizza away to the people that ride their bike here, especially if you're from Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> How many people are from Chicago here? Yeah, wow, a lot. Right on. Cool. Uh, let's see. Let's keep it going. Lore. Lore Sabrin. Yeah, yeah. Give it up. Hey, everyone. It's so great to see such a huge turnout tonight. Uh, so grateful to be here. The Red's a really special place to me. It's actually the first place I ever climbed outside. And, uh, so it means a lot to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking tonight about a project that I took on in 2020. And I did have a rock climbing project that year. This is it. It's called The Cousin of Death. Um, it's an amazing 600 foot continuous craft climb in Flagstaff, Arizona. It has all the amazing things that any rock climb that you want to do has, has scary runouts, got shots, um, also like a lot of really amazing classic climbing sections that I spent weeks figuring out, but the actual project that I took on that year was that alongside of this route, I told my best friend that I would make a film with him about being a transgender athlete. And it's one of the things that I've always been terrified about talking about in the climbing community, I thought that I would be safer if I just really downplayed my gender identity because sometimes even just introducing myself can cause a political debate about whether I deserve to exist or not. So I included this piece from the film um, to show kind of how I was feeling about it in the beginning. I think... I actually don't know how to make this right. Let me see. Okay, thanks, Justin. Okay, I'm on. But obviously, it's a, something probably a lot of you can relate to in your rock climbing. But it was really this sense of fear that I felt about putting this film out in the world. 
um, at the time, when Blake, my friend who's a filmmaker, approached me about it, I really was feeling like, why me? Right? Like, why? What's a climbing film going to do in this debate where people's basic rights are being taken away, where we're having the highest rates of trans people being killed in the US year after year, um, and where little kids are being subjected to having medical inspections to see which sports team they're allowed to play in. I was like, really, what can I do to make a difference in that? Um, and after talking to him, what I realized was that what we needed are more human stories, right? We need stories where we can see someone not for their identity, but for all of the messiness that makes them a human being and allows us to create relationships. And so something that I realized was that in climbing, right, we know so well that the relationships that we form really allow us to witness each other's vulnerabilities, to witness each other getting scared, being uncomfortable, and find ways to support each other in those spaces. So I really started to realize what the impact of the film was when I started to tour around with it. Um, recently I did a screening in Lander, Wyoming. How many people have been to Lander? Yeah, awesome. Um, so Lander, although so many climbers go there in the summer and, and have an amazing time there, it's actually a really small town. And the kids that go to school there um, often don't receive a lot of support, especially queer kids, um, in exploring their gender identity. There's been a lot of hate. And when I went to do the screening there, there were two teens from the local high school that opted into speaking on a panel. Now, the film touches on suicide in the trans community, and when that film, that when that scene came up in the film, I noticed that these two kiddos left the room. And I was, you know, I've seen that scene a million times, I didn't need to see it again. Decided to leave the room and chat with them. And what I found out was that one of their friends had completed suicide the week before, who was in the queer community. And they weren't sure if they would ever be safe at their high school. And we were talking, we ended up mostly talking about dinosaurs and just kind of decompressing. But something that came up was they were like, I don't know what to do. Like, you're, and they kept saying, like, Laura, you're so brave. Like, you just went out there and you shared everything about you, but like, we can't do that. And something that really occurred to me was that when I said it to them, my response was, you know, this isn't about you going out and screaming. This is about you living a joyful life and the next person after you getting to see that. And I hadn't taken the time to say that to myself. This year, in addition to the film, I wrote a piece with my friend Madeline, who was the only queer climber I had ever seen before I came out. Um, she was someone that really led the way for me to see myself in the climbing space. And we also had a really hard climbing relationship. We wrote this piece about a trip that we took to the Hulk, and it's the kind of climbing trip that you just never talk about to anyone else, let alone write a climbing piece about or something for an article because we literally didn't summit anything. Like we went through the trip, we like picked a really exciting, inspiring objective. We tried that, we didn't get to the top of that. We were like, let's go a little lower. We picked something else, we like didn't get to the top of that. We were just epicking. And part of what was going on was that we were really trying to figure out how to be with each other in the space because we had both spent so much time trying to hide our queer identity that being together in that space felt really exposing and it made it hard to do to climb, which is something that's exposing in itself. As we were writing the piece, what really became obvious about our relationship was that what was most powerful were the moments when we got to witness ourselves as intensely human. In, we ended up writing a series of letters to each other, and this was an excerpt from one of the letters that I wrote to Madeline. It said, Dear Mad, Allowing you to be a human meant letting go of the belief that I could somehow rise above my own history of grief and pain if I sent the next grade. I was heartbroken, but I also felt a raw sense of freedom. Right, there's so often that I had chosen to really exaggerate these parts of myself as, clim as a climber and just chase grades in order to maybe earn a sense of safety in this community. Putting the film out and sitting with people who had never felt safe in the climbing community before and realizing that part of the gift that we're giving is showing up as fully human was a really big game changer for me in the ways that I've shown up in the community since then. This year I've been trying another, just like all of us, right? We finish a project, we find a new one. 
I uh, had my new hardest line ever, right? And have been going out there every weekend. Something that's been really striking me about going out to this climb, right? Anytime that we climb, we sacrifice things, just like Sophie was talking about in her presentation, right? So many of us are over here this weekend. We probably planned our whole weeks around getting down here for the weekend and being able to be in this space. It's such a privilege, and when we go out, we really have to think about what we're up to, right? And so one of the things that I've really been thinking about this year is how in my climbing do I find this space of joy that I get to share with others? And how do I allow my climbing to fuel the work that I do in these spaces and activism spaces and allow it for me to show up as fully myself and is also really energized to do the work that I need to do. I work as a mental training coach and a lot of times the question comes up of like, what are we really up to in our climbing? Um, why do we even climb? And this was a quote that Madeline actually shared at the end of our article. I don't necessarily think that it answers the question for all of us, but I think it's a really great start, not just for our inspiring climbing projects, but also for the hard work that we need to do in the world. We came out here just to be us. Our laughter, our wounding, our happiness, and our fighting. So, I'm going to leave you all with that. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Ooh, thank you so much, Laura. Give it up one more time for Laura Saberin. Yeah. Yeah, we think, we think climbing is about being bold, but getting up here and on the stage and talking about these issues that haven't historically been talked about in the climbing community is a whole different kind of boldness. And so I really admire people like Laura for being will, willing to do that. All right, uh, next up we got Kate Rutherford. Yeah, one of my dear friends, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Such a treat. I'm really glad she's in the purple. I'm also hungry. Sisters of the Purple Tribe. I see some more out there. Brother of Holy Cross, thank you for representing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Justin, can you go to the top of the presentation? That would be awesome. <laughs> So, my name is Kate Rutherford, and um, if you'd scroll to slot number one, that'd be rad. But um, I live out in Bishop, California, and so it's pretty special for me to get to be out here in the rad southern sandstone land. It's such a treat. Thanks y'all for sharing. And um, Justin, can you go to the top of this slideshow? <laughs> um, all right, everybody chug a deer, deer for technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, speed preview. Maybe. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> um, I'm not embarrassed yet, but I might get there. All right. <laughs> so my name's Kate Rutherford, and I grew up in the interior of Alaska. And I am a rock climber, and really, I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you all about um, one of my new projects, um, if I can figure out how to use this thing, um, called Farm to Crag. And so, a lot of my life has been based around how to stay stoked in the mountains, and part of that is what to wear, thank you Patagonia, and part of that is what to eat. So. Growing up in Alaska, we had a homestead and lived a long way from the grocery store. And so everything we ate or drank or wore for warmth came in on the dog sled. And it was kind of a big deal. So we'd go out for the whole winter and we'd have only the provisions that we could carry in on the sled. So that was kind of this rad springboard into the rest of my life where I went to school as a biologist and artist and ended up in Yosemite. Um, working on search and rescue and learning all sorts of really, really useful things like how to climb the monster off it. And um, some of the proudest things I'm proudest of is Madeline Zerbin and I, who we were just talking about a moment ago, were the first team of women to free the free rider. Um, so that was cool, but then I decided I should go to Patagonia and try to follow in, you know, 
Tommy and Alex and call in his footsteps and climb all of the Patagonia, you know, logo, skyline. And so I spent seven seasons down there doing that. And, you know, this is Colin Haley on the north face of Fitzroy. And some of that climbing was so scary, yet, but so magical that, you know, I kind of couldn't get enough and kept going back year after year. And there was these women who cooked for us um, at the La Senora restaurant and we went every night and eventually when I sent the seventh summit and you know was kind of done with my whole project in Patagonia they named a salad after me and that might have been more proud than free free rider um, so anyway I feel really lucky that I've had these people all over the world taking care of me. You know, they're at home growing the food and cooking for us while we're out in the mountains. And eventually, I moved to the Eastern Sierra. This is on the Hulk where Laura just was. Um, and it was about the time when Patagonia changed their mission statement to be that we're in business to save the home planet. And that meant that every single one of us climbers that works as an ambassador for Patagonia also had to be completely focused on saving the home planet. And that was new, right? That was not different, but it was new and interesting and really powerful. And so then my trips really became focused on how I might make a difference in the world. And so this idea about Farm to Crag is how can we climbers be inspired to invest in the local sustainable food systems that we have in the places we climb. And that's really because I started learning that regenerative organic agriculture can really sequester carbon down out of the atmosphere and store it on the ground. It also creates healthier bodies and healthier <laughs> communities near crags. So then I started presenting all of these climbing trips based around food. So this, I went with a friend Ken Etzel to Spain to check out where the Patagonia Provisions mussels have come from. And we didn't actually have mussels on our pizza tonight, but we did have Patagonia Provisions um, little venison sausage links that they generously donated. And we cut up the sausage links and put them on your pizza. So thanks Patagonia Provisions. Um, so here's me swimming with the mussels, trying to learn where my food comes from. And mussels are this awesome, like, low food on the totem pole. I guess that's so good to see. Um, anyway, they are filter feeders and create beautiful protein out of tiny, tiny phytoplankton. I was such a fish out of water. This was, like, the most awkward moment in my life. <laughs> anyway, get, I got really excited about trying to change the food paradigm. And being in Europe, um, the you know, at the base of the Picos de Europa, there's such incredible produce, like these little tiny farmers markets all over Europe. And I realized that that was um, true in a lot of America, too. There's really rad farms right here, you know, on the ridges on the Red River Gorge where we climb. And so it really inspired me to try to find a way to, like, build all of us climbers a map to make it really easy to invest in these people that care about the food they're growing and try to make it a more viable business for them. Um, and so these are sort of the farm to crag tenants. Um, we really want to support people's individual health, we really want to support crag-side community health, and then we really want to support environmental health. And I'm pretty sure that we can do that as a community by building this cool map, which I'll need your help with if you have any cool farms or restaurants like Mills or Hops or, you know, um, Red Point, all of the folks around here that source locally. Um, and then community engagement, I guess this is part of that. But um, we also have cool events and then peer-to-peer -peer education, which looks a lot like taking climbers farming and taking farmers climbing. So it's been a cool <laughs> journey. I've been learning a ton about regenerative agriculture and how the, that can really bring us back to a place where we understand a lot of where our nutrients come from and how we can respect the land that we love so much. So recently, I was lucky enough to go check out this new crag I'd never been to before. Has anybody been here? 
What is it? What is it? Custer! Woo -woo. So I got to go to South Dakota for my first time, and it was all in search of these bison because there's this <laughs> ranch called the Wild Idea Buffalo Ranch that Patagonia has partnered with to make bison jerky. But these guys have really taken it upon themselves to restore the prairie and the native grasses by bringing the bison back to the land and that um, really is a way that the grasses have evolved with the bison impact so the bison roam around eat the grasses which encourages deeper roots and then the bison poop and pee all over it and then the little hooves beat it down in there so the nutrients get back into the ground and it's this awesome cycle that doesn't happen unless the bison are there. So I'm not sure if it's the chicken or the egg, like I'm not sure if I wanted to go see the bison or if I wanted to go rock climbing more, but either way it was a really spectacular adventure to go and climb in both Custer, the Needles, we went to the VC, and um, we went to Spearfish. And all along the way, we ate 100% local, organic um, food from really inspiring ranchers. And part of what I've been realizing is that it kind of gets me out of my normal hamster wheel into these really beautiful places. And, you know, we ended up getting to help herd the buffalo for like, hours and that was so cool I just hang out with these ranchers and ask them questions and realize that they're just normal people like us who are doing rad stuff and that looks a lot more like riding horses around to chase bison and you know they have so much knowledge and love for the land and I want these folks to be our heroes too you know it's like Alex Nagos, Tommy Y'all are my heroes, Laura, for sure. But, you know, these farmers are actually eating us. And Magos might give you a carrot later, to be clear. But it's been really fun to get to learn um, how climbers can be a really positive influence in these communities where we hang out just by eating really tasty food. So, all that to say is um, I encourage you to go on a road trip and use our local food maps, farmtocrag.org slash map, um, is a pretty cool way to find rad local farmers to hang out with. There's local farmers markets, um, all sorts of fun ways to get involved. We have recipes on our website. Um, and then the last thing is we have events that um, get communities together. We have one in Yosemite every year, and these are really a way to engage and learn more about cooking from Brittany Griffith, or um, farming, or you know how to build high tunnels. Um, we do farm work, we have lectures on soil science, and then we get to take the farmers climbing, which is super rad. Um, and there is so much joy on the faces of these folks that are so farm strong, but definitely haven't climbed <laughs> rocks before. And this is in Chattanooga, and these guys live like 20 minutes walking from, you know, Just Denny right and Foster Falls. So it's been really a pleasure to get to learn from our community. <laughs> There's so many folks. Like this is the native. Um, Southern Miwok in Yosemite and they have all sorts of rad acorns that they harvest and other service berries and all these incredible berries that they came and talked to us about. Um, local soil scientists come to our events. Um, Ashina came and taught us how to make her lip with her favorite local crack snack. <laughs> and we learned how to make um, sauerkraut. Brittany's cooking breakfast. Um, so it's been pure joy to get to welcome folks into this really nourishing way to climb and get to know your farmers and you know wanting to get us off of our little screens and kind of get us into community together and cooking for each other and really showing the love for each other you know whether it's the love of your land or just you know, celebrating your community, but celebrating local flavors is pretty freaking awesome. Thanks for listening.
Thank you so much, Kate. Um, yeah, I went to one of these Farm to Crag events a few years ago, and uh, I had this trippy conversation with this guy that knew a lot about trees. He introduced me to this idea of mycelium, where, all, where I learned that all the trees are talking to each other underground through this crazy fungal network, and it was pretty sweet, pretty moving to think about nature in that way. And then I went home and planted a garden which uh, worked for one year and then for some reason it didn't work the next year. Um, really quick, by the way, found a credit card sitting on the ground. Uh, Anna M. Velezquez, I got your credit card, come find me. <laughs> Maybe show me your ID as well. Um, awesome, so uh, next up is one of my main man crushes, Nico Fravis, yeah, yeah. Hello, hello. So first of all, I have a little message to the public. Um, I'm looking for a ride to Louisville tomorrow night at Lee after darkness. I'm trying to echo point my way back to the airport. So if any one of you is driving that way tomorrow night or very early Monday morning, I'm, I will be uh, with you. <laughs> So, if you, if you don't know me from my climbing performance, you probably know me from my music artwork. This is a, a, a music you might have heard, Dodo's Delight, with a special guest, guest star, Bob Shepton, a 75-year-old captain. Or, you, if you don't know that one, you probably know Don in our one. And I'm actually here to present you my latest music artwork and tell you a little bit uh, how it is came all together. So basically it came together because in 2020 I went with Patagonia with my uh, usual climbing partner, Sean Villanueva. We had actually a, a very good season there. We had nice, uh, a few nice uh, weather window, windows which allowed us to climb some nice first ascent. We free to climb some uh, nice lines. We also uh, enjoyed the acoustic of some walls there. We had some nice BVs and we uh, also enjoy the local specialties. This is the equivalent of a Budweiser in uh, Patagonia. And after two months of climbing there, uh, I had about two weeks left and I checked the weather forecast and, and I could only see bad weather so I decided to return home two weeks earlier to start working on my vegetable garden at home. Uh, but uh, as soon as I arrived home, I actually learned about the pandemic and I was uh, locked down. And, I, and Sean stayed there and he was locked down there for a year and a half. And because he lost me as a, his climbing partner, he was forced to learn how to climb on his own. And that's actually the reason why he's not here, because, because he's climbed on his own, he's received a Piole d'Or, because he managed to climb on his own the whole traverse, the Fitz traverse on his own which he uh, uh, named the uh, moon, uh, Moonwalk. Anyway, uh, I, I was also stuck alone at home, so I had to be creative and, and, and keep climbing. But after a while climbing on my own, I knew Sean was in, stuck in Patagonia, where there is so many hot girls. And I knew that there was a high risk that he might meet a uh, very hot girl and he would get in love and I would lose my climbing partner forever. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, we kept in touch and he was sending me pictures occasionally. And here, as you can see, I think he hadn't met yet uh, that girl. So I was a little relieved when he sent me that picture. But that made me start to think about how about re like I might need to replace Sean. But it's a hard one because who can replace Sean? So I, I made a little casting and I, I understood the, burst, the best person to replace Sean. He's also a Belgium guy called Sebastian Bert. I don't know if you, have, you know him. He's the first person to ground up, free climb, to free climb ground up the nose. Uh, and most of it, he's, besides being cool, he looks very good. So that was very appealing to me. He's a strong climber. but. The, the most important for me was that he was, uh, he's actually a very good singer as well. So when we start to, to think about what to do together, we, uh, 
he actually had the idea to cross a uh, big part of the Alps to connect three major multi-pitch, uh, which is called now uh, the Alpine Trilogy. They were put up in the, the, the 90s by legendary climbers. You might know uh, Stefan Glovax, Thomas Huber. And at, the ta at that time, it was really pushing the level of uh, multi-pitch climber, multi-pitch climbing. Still now, it's uh, not that easy of a climb. But anyway, uh, he had the idea to connect these clients uh, riding a bicycle. The only thing was I uh, had just adopted a dog, it was only four months, and I know how crucial it is this first month of education when you adopt a dog. So I told him, I can come with you, but the only condition is that I have to bring my dog. And since he had a dog, he, he had to bring his dog as well. So that's, uh, that was the ingredients to start the adventure. The pro Sebi was very, before starting, uh, Step was really focused on a project he had in Seu. So until the day before we left, actually, we had, ne we had didn't prepare. So it was really last minute preparation. And actually, we had never tried to ride with our dogs, all the climbing equipment, you know, the dog food, our food, the camping equipment. So it's a lot of weight. And um, actually, Sebi built this, uh, the, the, um, the trailer for his dog like around midnight the night before we left and I don't know if it was because he was drunk already but uh, you see it was a little tight the but it's incredible this animal gets used to basically uh, anything so the, the main difference between uh, Sean and Seb is obviously you can see Seb has a lot of less facial hair than Seb than Sean uh, and it seems like facial hair really is helpful to climb these uh, dirty, loose, uh, wet pitches. But also one great difference between uh, Sean and Seb is that Seb has a lot more style, as you can see. He basically can't climb hard if he's not wearing his pink lycra, his uh, pink flamingo on his harness. And at the very beginning, I was making a lot of fun because this piece of clothing, which looks like the fur of a, like a bear skin, uh, it was the, the warmest piece of clothes he brought on this trip. And he's a Patagonia ambassador. Uh, he could have brought many nice down jackets, but he preferred to, to actually bring this piece of clothing on this trip. But slowly I understood that actually this piece of clothing is uh, it's so, um, it's actually a piece of clothing revolutionary. It's highly technical because it's so polyvalent. He used it for uh, cleaning his feet, used it as a towel, uh, used it uh, to dry the dishes, uh, to make a bed for his dog, uh, and many other things. So he, Seb also, you know, was walking with this uh, pink flamingo in the mountains, and that brought a lot of nice interaction with other people walking. As you can see here, even on the belay, he always would wear this, uh, the, the, his, this technical piece of clothing. And one, this, uh, quickly, yeah, I was laid back there. Uh, one of the main motivation to climb this route, this, this multi-pitch very quickly was that if we climbed it quickly, we could have more time to relax and enjoy our time in the mountain, to get inspired, to compose some new tunes for you guys, or fan club to stay happy with whatever we bring. And here you see a Sepp uh, working on s some words. Also for our dogs, it was paradise. I mean, for the dogs, they are just happy to be with their owner in the, wil in the wilderness. Um, so here you can see uh, the technical piece of clothing working well for uh, Seb's dog. And yeah, what, one of the great thing, I've been climbing for more than 25 years and now I, I know people all over the world. And on this trip, for example, it seemed like every 20 kilometers I knew somebody where we could be hosted. We, I have many friends all over the world. And actually, uh, so we, we got hosted very often, but as you can imagine, well, as you can imagine, when you, three dirty climbers arrive somewhere with dogs, bikes, um, usually after one day they let you know that it's time to keep going. So that also helped us. 
So here I enforce Sepp to clean himself a little more regularly at the end. Our dogs also had to learn how to uh, rock climb a bit. And yet we, we put so much work into uh, styling it to get to the climb. So we, with Sepp, we decided we might as well try to maximize our style point in the climbing as well. So all these routes, we tried them ground up and we, we uh, climbed them from the ground trying to red point every pitch, uh, pitch per pitch. And if we didn't red point one pitch, we would just wait until we, we red point them. And that actually was the, the best re recipe to have really a great adventure. Some of the climb we spent uh, more than 20 hours just fighting to red point them, uh, giving sometimes more than 10 tries on, on a pitch, climbing in the night. And yes, slowly this pink flamingo we got uh, through the three uh, roots of the Alpine trilogy. And yeah, this is the, the best ingredient. So having an adventure like, like this for me is the best ingredient to get inspired, to compose a good tune so that you guys uh, really enjoy it. And so therefore I'm going to show you the, the, the video clip of uh, this uh, music we composed on this trip. All right, nice, uh, amazing, thank you. Oh wait, are we doing the YouTube clip? Oh, we are. En pédalant vers les montagnes De Suisse, d'Autriche et d'Allemagne À la recherche de saint Graal, Des rochers sur un piédestal On a cherché au Vatican Par le travail on a la bonne Des petits pieds des d'Alacor Un bout de caillou qui vaut Des pédales en boucle de poids, des hypettes en bicyclette, une couche de peau du vélo, des arcs et nos mollets. Des pédales en boucle de poids, des hypettes en bicyclette, une couche de peau du vélo. La trilogie nous voilà. Regardons donc dans les alpages, où y croiser de belles bergères, et pas qu'en grimpant s'y faire. Puis et du courage, du réconfort entre le roi, mais n'y croiser que des bergers, du réconfort n'en trouvera que dans du schnapp sa grande gorge. Des pédales en bout de poids, des hypettes en bicyclette, une couche de peau du vélo, des arcs et une monnaie. Des pédales en bout de poil, des hypettes en bicyclette, une couche de peau du vélo, la trilogie nous voilà. On a passé l'île de Kaiser, pour y déshabiller l'empereur, de l'esprit de la longueur. Rapidement calme nos ardeurs Les pays mouillés des essais trop A la lueur d'une seule frontale Faire la guerre c'est pas banal Jusqu'à ce qu'on soit en petits morceaux Des pédales au bout de poil Des hypettes en bicyclette Qui couche le pot du vélo Des arcs et un ordre
troisième pour la route Ne rien lâcher, groupe que coûte End of Silence, la trilogie Bien mérité la fleur Mais toutes ces prises que l'on sert N'en diront pas cet effet de serre Le seul métal que l'on répand Et celui qui sort de nous De pédale au bout de bois Des soupes en bicyclette Une bouche de peau du vélo Des arcs et nos mollets De pédale au bout de bois Des soupes en bicyclette de peau du vélo, des arcs et nos mollets, la ligne de bout de marche, la soupe et son capot, c'est que des on a moi, des croquettes on a moi, du chat ce qu'on en voit, des pédales de bout de bois, des épées dans des cimetières, et le flamant bout de son volant. On sent qu'il y a une énergie dans ce qu'on voit, c'est pas compliqué. La spiritualité, je pense. N'est-ce pas C'est vrai. Ouais. Tout à fait, d'ailleurs, je suis en train de même. Oh my god, that's so amazing. <laughs> Now you see why Nico is my man crush. Man, as a side note, um, Seb tried to eco point the Dawn Wall this year. He freaking sailed from Bel or from Spain all the way to Mexico and then drove to Yosemite and tried to do it all without, you know, taking a plane, which was kind of amazing. <laughs> Didn't quite pull it off, but really, really close. Um, awesome. So next up we have Eddie Taylor. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, woo! So, Eddie is one of the most diverse athletes these days. He climbed, I mean, I don't know, maybe I should just let you do it all. They'll, they'll find out. But I, I took a trip with Eddie earlier this year, and it was pretty amazing because we got in a car and drove back and forth to Lander, Wyoming from Colorado, and, which was about 12 hours in the car, and I don't think there was like a single second of silence. And, you know, you've kind of clicked with somebody when that happens. So, yep, Eddie, awesome. Thanks so much, man. Awesome. Thank you, Tommy. A lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> and now I'm going to start talking about mountain climbing at the best sport climbing destination in the world. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm Eddie Taylor. Um, I'm a science teacher. I'm a track and field coach. <laughs> and I'm a climber. And it's funny, you guys have probably all experienced this, but when you talk to people that aren't climbers and you're like, I'm a climber, and they're like, oh, you must be a little crazy, or you get that second question, I'm pretty sure you guys have gotten this, have you ever climbed Everest before? So, um, I have an answer to that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, where, but yeah, <laughs> so uh, to talk about Everest a little bit, I want to talk about where I began. And so... My mom grew up in inner city Chicago. Woo! And yeah. And so I lived my younger years there and like the outdoors, climbing, camping, hiking was like something that we didn't do. Like black people don't go camping. That was just like the mantra that I got growing up. But then we moved to the, the Southwest. We moved to Kayenta, Arizona, this small town. The average household income was $15,000. There was one stoplight, it was all dirt roads. And there was my family and three white families and everyone else spoke Navajo. It was just what it was. And we didn't really know what to do. Like, I didn't know what to do when you're not in the city. But uh, anyway, our, uh, my mom's co-workers taught us to go camping. They gave us a gear list. I went to Walmart, got, some, got a tent, got a sleeping bag. My mom wouldn't let me buy shoes because I already owned shoes. And we went to national parks and took lots of pictures in front of signs. We went on all the nature hikes, and you guys know, like, eight-year-olds love nature hikes. Like, they just love them when you're eight years old. You love to walk in nature, you know? But, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, I didn't really fall in love with, with the outdoors back then, but I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so fast forward, I moved back to the Midwest. I got involved in normal sports. I lived, I still didn't live in inner city Chicago. I lived in a bunch of different environments with a, in a bunch of different places. Um, 
but I was like, I want to go back to the mountains, and the best way for me to go back to the mountains is to go to Colorado, because I know there's mountains in Colorado. And so I did that, but unfortunately, I didn't really climb at Colorado either. I decided to run track. Um, but like all good things, they come and go, and I was in Boulder, Colorado. I literally knew nothing about rock climbing, but a friend of my, mine asked me if I'd come belay them on the project. I didn't know what that means, but she gave me a harness and a grigri. And she said, if I fall, just let go. <laughs> so um, anyways, it worked. And then the next, the next pitch, she gave me her quick draws and said, your turn. It was like a 5-8, get to the top. And I didn't even know taking was a thing. But you know what? That inspired my love for climbing. And so I started to climb. I started to climb a lot. I started to shape my life into how I can climb as much as possible while teaching, while coaching, like, you know, I have summer vacation, which is awesome. That's like the one perk of being a teacher. There's not many perks, but that's one of them. Um, and so I kind of started shaping my life into that. And climbing became my thing. And it was just something that I did with my close friends and I got really psyched on it. And I, you know, I'd pick an objective and I'd learn how to climb for that objective. But about, there we go. But about two years ago, I met this guy named Phil Henderson. And he had this idea. I was literally just at the dog park in Uray, Colorado. It's like middle of nowhere, Colorado. And like not a lot of climbers ice climb and not a lot of black climbers ice climb either. Like it's even smaller. And we were just at the dog park and we were walking around and he was like, you ice climb? And I was like, yeah, I ice climb. And he was like, oh, cool. Like it was just a little conversation. And I got to know him. We traded numbers and eventually he told me about this project he was putting together. He wanted to have the first all-black team to go to Mount Everest. And I was kind of skeptical. I was like, man, I just want to rock climb. I mean, isn't there just like a bunch of rich people in Everest? Isn't there like a bunch of dead bodies? Isn't there just like, isn't there trash everywhere? Like who would want to just like hike up a big mountain? But he explained to me like his experience being in the outdoor industry for 30 years and how he spent a lot of time in Nepal and getting to know the people and they knew him in Nepal as the only black person he's been there so many times and so he wanted to like connect the community here with the community there and so that's where this trip came came from and he told me like before I left he was like I think this trip can happen I'm like 90 95 percent sure it's gonna happen and I thought 90 95 percent sure it's gonna happen meant that it was 95 percent funded but I learned a month or two later that it wasn't funded at all, and it kind of became my full-time job on top of teaching is how are we going to make this trip happen, and how are we going to get people to care about this trip. And it was really draining, and I spent a lot of time doing that. I spent less time climbing and even less and less time climbing. And then maybe a couple months after we made like the announcement and we started raising the little, little bits of money, I was like, man, i got to take a break. And so I ended up going to Zion last year and climbing Moonlight Buttress. And uh, it was kind of hard. Like, I showed up and I climbed up the first four pitches. It felt great. It got to pitch five. It felt a little better. And I got to pitch six. And I was like, man, I haven't been climbing. I am not falling in gear. This stuff is really scary. I don't know what I'm doing here. And it, I proceeded to aid that pitch and took like an hour and a half for me to place all my cams to get to the top. And I got down. I was like, I'm done. I'm going home. Is, I'm, I'm done. But I talked to a friend that night, and he had told me, he's like, you know, just go back the next day, try it again. I was able to get to the top. I wasn't able to send it. But um, I just did that for four more days in a row, and eventually I sent her out. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> but um, when I got back, we got a little bit of funding. We were, we were, I had like stopped checking emails. I was like, I'm done. I needed, I just need a break. You know, sometimes you just need to go climbing. I needed a break, and that's what I did. But when I got back, we had a little bit of funding, and Phil was like, "All right, well, that's the top of the night." But Phil was like, "You're gonna go to Nepal, and not forever. So you're gonna go to Nepal and help out at the climbing school." And I already like told my boss. I walked in one day and was like, "Hey, I'm taking ten days off to go climbing because I'm I'm a little burnt out." Now I have to tell my boss, I'm going to take a month off to go to Nepal to uh, just to teach, basically. But I got to say, this was the best part of my entire experience last year. I went to Nepal. I learned so much about 
a teaching actually as well about climbing and as well about the community. And I got to know everyone, everyone that we worked with in Everest. I got to know their families. I got to know their kids. I got to see why, how this mountain was really important to them, their economy, and also just like their drive to walk 30 miles from their village to come learn how to tie a figure eight knot. Because like a lot of these people, they're super skilled. They've climbed Everest many times. But some of those basic skills, they just never learn. So it was really cool to be able to share that as well as um, just really connect. So um, I actually don't remember the next slide. Um, this is the actual Everest trip. And for me, it was, this was the scariest part. The runway is like, there's a, literally a cliff like at the end of the runway <laughs> that you fly into. And so it was, it was a little sketchy. But to be honest, the trip to Everest Base Camp was amazing. It was like a yellow brick road. Super nice bridges. You didn't carry water because you stopped at tea houses all the time. It was, it was like, it was a little bougie, honestly. It was like kind of bougie backpacking to the base camp. Um, but then you get to base camp and like the real climbing starts. The real climbing meaning you're gonna hike a couple hours a day and take lots and lots of breaks. But it's still climbing. Um, but then, but you kind of go up and down the mountain and up and down the mountain and um, eventually you go to the top. <laughs> but, I mean, it's just been interesting, like this whole process and the whole <laughs> things I started, um, the preconceptions and misconceptions I came out with. And it's like, was there trash in the mountain? Yeah, Camp 4, there was so much trash in the mountain. Were there dead bodies? Yes, I walked over one dead body. It was, it was it, I mean, it was, it just is what it was. Was there a lot of people who, it was their first time putting on crampons in their entire life? Yes, there was. But it also is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Oh yeah, a lot of our team did yoga every day. I, I don't do yoga, but I took some pictures. But it was one of the beautiful places I've ever seen. Going to the ice vault, it was like, cool. Like, if it wasn't dangerous, it would be really fun. But it was kind of dangerous, like that, you know, you're trying to go through as fast as possible because it's just moving ice. But like, the views that we got from Camp Up High, like, these things don't even do it justice. And then, being able to spend time with the team up there and just like make, make that community, and make the community, when I say the team, not just the black people from the U.S. that I went with, but the entire Sherpa team, like, those are memories that I'm never going to forget. And, um... Yeah, the other one is like, was it crowded? Yeah, it was crowded, but you can always just unclip from the rope and keep going to the top. Like, all the things that you hear about that are super negative, like, they really weren't that bad. I mean, I went to the mother load yesterday, and the mother load was so crowded. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to wait in the line. But, but it was a really good time. And I didn't really get, this isn't my photo because I just went to the top in the dark and saw absolutely nothing and then came down. But um, at least I didn't freeze and get stuck in traffic. So, kind of the biggest takeaway I have, like, growing up, I didn't come from the out an outdoor community. I didn't know really what much about climbing, but I did actually know about Everest. I knew there was like some story of a bunch of old white guys that went and died. Like, that's just the story that I heard growing up. And it was something I never thought I could do. But kind of with the opportunity and and um, through kind of what we did where we reached out to inner city schools and I talked to like people in my community, or kids in my community, like was hopefully we could change the narrative of like these outdoor activities, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be Everest, it can be sport climbing, rock climbing, drag climbing, that there's just lots of opportunities that anyone can do. So thank you guys for your time, thanks for listening. Yeah! Yeah, nice, Eddie, thank you, amazing. Okay, so uh, we have one more speaker tonight. Woo! Remember who it is? Alex Magos. Woo! Right on, Alex, give it up. Where's Alex? You can always spot him because he's wearing yellow. Oh, this is Alex. Hey guys, my name is Alex. Let's hear it for Country Boy Beer. Good and tag. How many of you have Clatton in uh, Yosemite? Raise a hand. Yeah. Good. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. 
Hey, I'm Hans. <laughs> Do you actually know who that was? He's my father. I'm just joking. <laughs> Does anybody uh, seen this uh, device to like change the pictures? Eddie, did you take that? The clicker. Thank you. Because I did not bring one beautiful car to show you. I like brought a few actually. If the clicker would work. <laughs> oh, there we go. It's not a pretty carrot. It is. How about that one? Fucking amazing. This one? Beautiful. Who of you has seen such carrot in a supermarket already? Nobody, right. And why? Because they only sell the one foot long straight carrots. And all of those go in the bin. Isn't that sad? Yeah. So what I wanted to say is, don't waste your food. If you like had a pizza, bring it back home if you can finish it. Because like there's about 50% of food waste in the world. And that sucks. And if we wouldn't waste our food, we could literally feed the whole world five times over. So if you wanna see those carrots, then you probably have to go to your local farmer. <laughs> and there are actually local farmers here in uh, Kentucky. I just got uh, a bundle of carrots from Emily, I think is her name. Emily uh, Rogers or something? Yeah, you know her. Very good. Very good. I think I actually bought a few more carrots. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and uh, people were always asking me, how did it start with like this hashtag carrots for power? To be honest, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> I thought um, that people always brought so much shit to the crack, like chocolate and like biscuits and like cookies and Snickers and Mars and that kind of, like gummy bears here first row, for example. Yeah. So I wanted to show people that you can actually also have a healthy crack snack. That's why I uh, started hashtag carrots for power to animate people to eat their greens. Although I orange, but you know what I mean. It's like literally speaking. You know what I mean? Actually got a few more. I've also got like the rainbow color collection. And if people were wondering why the yellow carrots and the white ones don't taste as good, you have to put them in the oven. That's uh, what you have to do. But anyway, at some point, uh, well, I think lockdown came, like COVID came, and I had lots of time, so I was like, I kind of need to make something out of the hashtag carrots for power. So I decided, how cool would it be to maybe print a few t-shirts, sell them, and then donate the money to good causes. I mean, Patagonia sells t-shirts, I thought, I'll only sell yellow t-shirts because who would want any, anywhere a t -shirt, different t-shirt than yellow. So what I did, I started that and it actually, uh, yeah, it actually took quite off and I donated to quite a few different um, NGOs, but I'll get to that later. You're probably wondering, I've got another beautiful picture of a carrot over here. <laughs> and you might be wondering, why carrots? Isn't that the question you're all wondering about? Why carrots? Exactly, why carrots? So, now you have to listen, why carrots? This is, yeah, this is Alex Holland, I think he's also some famous climber. Let's see if it plays. Oh, we need to make it louder. Alright, let's, let's, we have to like, we have to play that again. <laughs> Alright, let's see if it works. I saw Alex Mangos eats carrots for power, and I realized that peppers are more nutritious and more delicious, so they must have more power. Take that, Alex Mangos. <laughs> Take that, Alex Mangos, he said, didn't he? <laughs> so, let's just pretend for a second, I'd be Alex Holland, right? Same name, he's a bit taller, he also likes yellow though. I'd have balls of steel, I'd be weak, but I'd have balls of steel. <laughs> I'd, I'd go climbing, I mean, I don't need to bring a big backpack, obviously, because I don't bring a rope, I don't bring gear. I like literally bring my shoes, my chalk bag, a bottle of water, and my pepper. <laughs> so here it is. I'm Alex Honnold, I get to the crack, I put my pepper in my backpack, I walk about, I don't know, 15 hours to some chossy big wall, but I want a free solo. I get to the base of the crack, I take down my backpack 
and it's dirty and I don't want to sit on the ground, so I fucking sit on my backpack. Okay, who wants to still be Alex Honnold now with his crack snack? So I say, take that, Alex Honnold. <laughs> well, thankfully, I also brought a carrot, which is, after I sat on it, absolutely immaculate. <laughs> That's why carrots for power, not peppers. So, who knows who this guy is? Probably nobody, right? Raise a hand who knows who this guy is. Oh, Kyle Sparks, well, you're a photo editor by Patagonia, that doesn't count. <laughs> so, this actually is the photographer of Wolfgang Gülich. Crazy shit, huh? Who doesn't know Wolfgang Gülich? Good. Whoever doesn't know Wolfgang Gülich, out. <laughs> Educate yourself, please. So anyway, Wolfgang Gullich was like the guy who climbed like the first 14D, I think it was in 92. So that's quite a while ago. It was like a year before I was born. With this guy, I thought, he's also a photographer, he's a designer. So we created, designed this Carrots for Power t-shirt, which I'm wearing right now. And we started selling those t-shirts and um, people surprisingly bought them and thought it's a cool idea. So uh, up from that point on, I think we raised almost 10 grand and donated to various NGOs like like women's rights organizations, uh, the Human Center of Rights uh, in Iran, we donated to Ocean Cleanup, to uh, uh, the Ukrainian refugees, we donated to Climbing for Change, Kai Leitner's organization, so exactly, like to loads of different organizations, to um, Dream Higher, a climbing organization in South Africa, taking kids to climb over there. and. Uh, I think it was, it was quite a cool experience to see for me how the community was psyched about it and how yeah, everybody um, yeah, was stoked to support, everybody got involved, people were sending in new designs for Carrots for Power t-shirts, they were sending in suggestions where, which donate, um, NGOs to donate to and that was something I really appreciated. And uh, at some point I thought it was, uh, it was time for a new Carrots for Power uh, t-shirt. So what we actually did over here is uh, we drew up some sketches with bunch of friends and some people and uh, made it quite hard actually because uh, on every design that we came up with the carrot either looked like a bomb or a rocket or a sausage and uh, we finally found this carrot for power logo which is if you haven't got it yet it's the bloody power button <laughs> yeah people ask me all the time what's that ring around the carrot <laughs> well it's the power button <laughs> now you know and if you want to, go buy the t-shirt and support the cause. Thank you. And also, thank you for coming out, Miguel. I have actually been here 10 years ago, literally almost on the day 10 years ago, November 2012. I feel like this didn't exist, like that didn't exist, the back of the house didn't exist. I was camping somewhere back there, had a really good time, and I'm hoping to have another good time here with you guys all. Thank you so much. Oh my god, it's Tommy Codwell. Yeah, thanks man. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, one more big shout out to all the presenters tonight. That was incredible. Woo! Um, yeah, I feel really honored to be able to do this event here tonight because as you have, as you probably noticed, Miguel's doesn't do a whole lot of events. It kind of has to mean something to them personally. And I think the fact that Patagonia has come in here and donated for flood relief and stuff like that. Probably played a role in that, so doing good stuff pays. Um, uh, on that note, doing good stuff means picking up your trash tonight. So as we all get out of here, make sure we don't fully thrash Miguel's. This is, we wanna live, leave this, this place pristine. Um, but we're also gonna party for a while. We're gonna start a fire over here. We're gonna be hanging out. Uh, it's only like 8.30, I can't believe it's only 8.30, so we still got some time, we'll be hanging out, we'll be partying, and uh, yeah, I think uh, quiet hours aren't until 11, so yeah, we got some time. Thanks again, um, yeah, have a good night, everyone. Cheers.